Um, our last speaker before the break is, is my colleague David Ducruz, who's going to talk about this and about the brain, I think. Thank you, Thank you very much, Graeme. Um, just to extend uh, the question session from the previous, um, Lindsay Byrne, who's in the audience, uh, and I um, are looking at fatigue in antifossil lipid syndrome. Uh, as Anderson said, this is an incredibly difficult area to look at, uh, but we're going to be doing some qualitative research, uh, which means uh, what are the factors that drive fatigue in APS patients uh, before moving on to clinical trials if we have. Um, I advise all patients with Hughes syndrome and lupus to take regular exercise. And the other bit of research that we did some time ago was actually weight loss. We did a study of a calorie controlled diet um, versus a, um, a low carb diet. And we showed that just by losing weight, fatigue improves. Um, so th these are simple things that could be done. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the, the brain and Hughes syndrome. Um, you've seen this slide already. Uh, thrombosis, venous and arterial and pregnancy loss. Um, and really, Graham should be given full credit for describing the syndrome. And it's, you know, it's with all our support that it's called Hughes syndrome. Now, I entirely agree with Graham. This is a brain disease. It's a neurological disease. And here's a very sad patient that I looked after many years ago when I was still at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. Uh, she was a 35-year-old nurse who came along. Um, she'd had a stillbirth and three previous miscarriages. Uh, and during the last pregnancy, before the stillbirth, she had something called HELP syndrome, where your platelets drop and your liver function tests uh, go off the scale. And she came in with a stroke. And you can see here that the baseline brain scan when she came into St. Bartholomew's was normal. We made a diagnosis of Hughes syndrome. We started treatment with anticoagulation, but despite treatment, she went on to have two more strokes, and then she bled into those strokes, and she sadly died. So this is a really serious complication. Uh, fortunately, we don't see so many of these um, severe patients, but it illustrates the point very well. There's a whole spectrum of symptoms and syndromes that you see with antiphospholipid syndrome. Headache, uh, Graham has mentioned already, is very, very common, especially migraine. And cognitive dysfunction, this is, Graham put up the very nice slide showing that these patients have memory problems, brain fog. Um, they forget friends' names, they forget where they're going, uh, they forget why they went into a room. Um, this is very, very well uh, described. It's also a feature of lupus and trying to distinguish what cognitive dysfunction is due to lupus and how much is due to Hughes syndrome is almost impossible. Strokes have been mentioned and I'll come back to those. Um, there are other types of thrombosis in the brain as well, as well as art arteries in the brain. There are veins or sinuses and they can clot as well. Seizures are a major manifestation of Hughes syndrome and movement disorders. I saw a 14 year old a couple of weeks ago who I discussed with Beverly Hunt, who suddenly developed massive career, these severe uh, shaking disorders. Uh, and then there's very controversially the multiple sclerosis like syndromes. So I'll try and touch on these in the next 10 minutes or so. So cognitive dysfunction has been studied um, a, a, a great deal. Uh, it's a strong association with memory disorders, um, with antiphospholipid syndrome uh, in lupus. Uh, cognitive dysfunction results in uh, reduced attention spans, reduced ability to concentrate, uh, and you're unable to process information. Uh, you do it slower than uh, other people. Headaches and seizures. So Graham Hughes many years ago made this observation that if you had a patient who had headaches and a previous history of seizures, they then had a blood clot, a deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. You start them on warfarin and immediately the headaches disappear. Not only do the headaches disappear, but the seizures stopped. In many cases, the seizures stopped and you were able to take these patients off their anticonvulsants, their anti-epileptic medication. So many years ago, um, Maria Quadrado with Graham's direction um, decided to look at this, we decided to look at headache in the antiphospholipid syndrome. And this was a proper control study, a randomized control study, uh, looking at getting patients with bad headaches to fill in a 56 question headache every day, a questionnaire, uh, and that's enough to give you a headache anyway, <laughs> every day. Um, but they did this, uh, wonderful patients, as Anna Sir said, it's um, patient involvement is critical, but these were well motivated patients. So these patients were given heparin injections, fill in the questionnaire of the headaches, stopped all treatment for two weeks, and then went on to a dummy treatment, uh, just injected themselves with the dummy, and nobody knew which was which. Um, the problem is, everybody got better, including the placebo patients, the dummy patients. And um, this was very disappointing to us, but it tells us the power of the placebo. Just simply injecting yourself um, is a very powerful thing to do, uh, and, and you know people got better. So we're no, a little bit no further on uh, from that point of view. 
Seizures are dramatic. Um, they occur in lupus patients. The prevalence is 10 to 15 percent in this particular study by Apollenza. Uh, and seizures in lupus are a feature of cerebral lupus on its own without antiphospholipid syndrome. But seizures in lupus are especially associated with the presence of strokes. And that makes a lot of sense. You've had a stroke, you damage brain tissue, that brain tissue, the electricity is disturbed, and then you can get seizures with it. Antiphospholipid antibodies, very strong association, obviously, with strokes and then with seizures. And then heart valve lesions, Munda Kamashta and Ricard Severo were the first to show that heart, heart valve lesions not, don't just occur in lupus, they are a feature of uh, antiphospholipid syndrome. This old um, label, Libman Sachs endocarditis, these funny um, vegetable like things on the heart valve, uh, are a feature of Hughes syndrome. And you can get little blood clots sitting on those uh, damaged valves, and they can break off and give you these splinter hemorrhages. They can break off and give you uh, mini strokes. So seizures are definitely a feature. Uh, and certainly in this context, with antiphospholipid antibodies and strokes, one would um, have a very powerful case for anticoagulating somebody like that. Now, this is a really controversial area. <clears throat> so a lot of patients come along with lupus or not. Um, they have a lot of headaches and sort of minor neurological symptoms. So the next logical thing to do is to do an MRI scan. So you do an MRI scan, and back comes your report showing these white matter lesions. Um, and we don't really know what they are. They could be areas where the blood is flowing more slowly. They could be mini strokes. Um, we don't know what they are. We, but we do know from big studies in the Netherlands that if you take elderly patients in their 60s and 70s who do have these lesions, um, this is the Rotterdam scan study, these patients have a higher risk of developing strokes in the future, in their 80s, sort of 10 years down the line. So the question here, the big question for us as clinicians is if we see a patient with minor symptoms maybe and these lesions, what do we do? This is a very controversial area. I think there's no controversy. If somebody has had clear symptoms of a stroke or signs of a stroke, they have to be anticoagulated. And, and warfarin, I think, would be the, the first line treatment. But if they have no symptoms or minor symptoms, if you like, it's very hard to justify putting somebody on warfarin for the rest of their lives if they've not had a proven thrombotic event. So what, we, what do we do in practice? We put all these patients on aspirin, even though there's absolutely not a shred of evidence that it does help. It's probably treating us more than the patient, but we think it does help. Um, and again, people have, many people have mentioned the hydroxychloroquine. Um, patients with lupus will be on hydroxychloroquine anyway, but if they're not on hydroxychloroquine, because hydroxychloroquine does have a weak blood thinning action, we would certainly consider adding hydroxychloroquine to aspirin. But again, there's no evidence uh, in this area. Where there is plenty of evidence, not just in lupus and antiphospholipid syndrome, but in the general population, is we must reduce the standard cardiovascular risk factors. And this is common sense stuff. Get your weight down, uh, stop smoking, get your cholesterol down. This is fairly standard stuff. And actually, as rheumatologists, we've been fairly, fairly poor at addressing these. Uh, we tend to ask the GPs to do it. But in fact, actually, there's been a sea change in our attitude to reducing cardiovascular risk factors. Um, and we're much more proactive now at addressing these in, in the clinic. So we come to the, this um, study, uh, published in a big journal, JAMA, Antiphospholipid Antibodies and Subsequent Thromboocclusive Events in Patients with Ischemic Strokes, the APAS Investigators. Now, um, I'm going to have to keep Munther away from the, the stage because he'll come here and he'll start fisting me. <laughs> um, this is a very controversial study. Okay, briefly, the, these studies started off looking at stroke in the general population. And it's a very important question. If you have a stroke, should you put a stroke patient on warfarin or just leave them on aspirin. This is completely independent of antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, so they did exactly that. They randomized large numbers of patients to either warfarin or aspirin. And you can see that there was no difference in either arm. Now this is where, and that was a reasonable, con a reasonable conclusion that there's no benefit from, if you had a stroke without antiphospholipid syndrome, um, there's no benefit to adding warfarin uh, to, to, to these patients. They then made a very controversial sub-study, and they looked at patients at the beginning of the study who happened to be tested for antiphospholipid antibodies just on one occasion. And they concluded, amazingly, that routine screening for antiphospholipid syndrome in stroke patients was not warranted. That's my exclamation mark. Now, many years ago, when I was a registrar, I used to go to these major conferences, and people would stand up and ask a question. They'd say, they pre preface their question with, um, with due respect, Professor de Cruz, that means they don't believe you. 
when they say, with the greatest respect, they say Professor de Cruz is talking a complete load of rubbish. This is a com with the greatest respect. This is a complete pile of rubbish, this study. And actually, Muntha stood up at the American College of Rheumatology with 15,000 rheumatologists and said exactly that. Um, so when we say critique, we mean this is a load of rubbish, this study. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go through this, but essentially there were so many problems with this paper. It was a, a miracle. I, I have no idea how it got into such a big journal as JAMA. Uh, this is definitely not a treatment trial of stroke in APS. And as far as I'm aware, there's never been a treatment trial taking patients with antiphospholipidine syndrome and randomizing them to warfarin and heparin. And I think that probably would be unethical to do now. This is a very important um, study in The Lancet. Uh, and this was looking at the predictive value of this terrible name, the lupus anticoagulant. Um, as people have already said, this is a test that's nothing to do with lupus. It's not even an anticoagulant. But it is a powerful risk factor. It's one of the sticky blood antibodies. And what they showed is that the odds ratio, if you're a young woman who um, uh, is lupus anticoagulant positive, you've had a stroke, um, that risk is massively increased by smoking and being on the pill, or even both. So it's very clear that the lupus anticoagulant, one of the major sticky blood antibodies, is a major risk factor for stroke. The risk is increased by having other risk factors, smoking in the pill, as I mentioned already. Uh, and the, the clear message is that if you're a young woman who's had a stroke, these patients should be tested for the antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, and and in, in our view, that should be all three antibodies, beta-2, glycoprotein-1, cardiolipin, and of course, the lupus anticoagulant. So I'm stretching even more controversially uh, difficult areas. Um, so we do know, we know that multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease. It's an autoimmune disease that particularly causes inflammation in the brain. Uh, it leads to uh, neurological signs and symptoms. People end up in wheelchairs. We also know that if you do prospective studies of standard multiple sclerosis clinic patients stand, attending a neurologic clinic, and you test them for a bunch of antibodies, some of those patients will have antibodies, including lupus antibodies or antiphospholipid antibodies. The question is, is this what we call an epiphenomenon? Is it just bad luck? Is it because they've got an autoimmune condition, that's why they've got these antibodies and they're meaningless? Or is it a real phenomenon? Are these antibodies actually causing multiple sclerosis? This is very controversial. We have a large number of patients here at St. Thomas's Hospital, over 100 now, who've clearly got multiple sclerosis, who clearly have antiphospholipid antibodies. So the first question is, should all multiple sclerosis patients be tested for, for antiphospholipid syndrome? I don't think so. I, I think routine screening of MS patients, I think, is very controversial. I don't think I would do it. Where I would consider antiphospholipid antibody testing is in patients who have what the neurologists call atypical MS. So it looks like MS, but there's lots of features that don't fit for it. And certainly, uh, in our standard patients with lupus uh, or patients who've got antiphospholipid uh, syndrome, um, this is may, well, may well be what we call demyelinating syndromes. In other words, MS-like syndromes uh, may occur in patients. Um, and certainly, um, somebody with lupus who's developing multiple sclerosis-like syndromes, um, I would definitely test for antiphospholipid syndrome. What you do about it is a bit more controversial. Um, and the question here is, do you anticoagulate these patients or not? And, and again, there's no evidence at all in this area. There are a few patients who do benefit from being on anticoagulation. In my personal experience, and Graham may differ here, most don't, um, because these patients have, have suffered inflammation in the brain, and that's left damage and scarring, and no amount of um, anticoagulation is going to improve uh, that damage. There's this is, um, syndrome, Sneddon syndrome, which is livido reticularis and recurrent stroke. Uh, in fact, the vast majority of patients actually are antiphospholipid syndrome or Hughes syndrome patients. So treatment. Um, so cerebral APS is what we call um, when it affects the brain. Um, I think it's, it's very clear. A patient who's got moderate to high levels of antiphospholipid antibodies, persistently high, who has clear evidence both clinically and radiologically, if they've got cerebrovascular ischemia or stroke-like syndromes, I don't think anybody would argue that these patients would need to be on warfarin. And we would argue here that patients with um, arterial events, like strokes, need to have a higher target INR of three to four. And what we also need to do, obviously, is to eliminate all the other cardiovascular risk factors, improve blood pressure, get rid of diabetes, get your cholesterol down, stop smoking, uh, and lose weight. These are all equally as important, I'd say, uh, as anticoagulation. So my final slide um, is antiphospholipid Hugh syndrome is a common and treatable cause of neurological syndromes, especially ischemic syndromes. 
Um, and the other message I think for neurologists and uh, emergency physicians is that um, if a young woman comes in with a stroke, you need to ask them about symptoms for lupus, you need to ask them about a previous history uh, of miscarriages, uh, and you need to screen patients for antiphospholipid syndrome. Thank you very much for your attention.